we're live again. Welcome to Gateway X here at the NMRA X studio. Our next presenter might have taught you skiing if you enrolled on a New Hampshire ski slope way back when. Summertime, he builds kits and documents them into clinics for us. A big contributor to Bar Mills, as seen at many train shows, our next presenter, Mr. Jack Ellis. How do you do? My name is Jack and I work for Bar Mills. Um, I'm out here doing uh, clinics all the time for Bar Mills and we're gonna give you a one today on the last two inches. And that is that little bit of space between the track and the back wall of your layout, where it's very hard to figure out how I get that to look just right with some perspective and some depth of field that we need in that little small space. So that's basically what we're gonna do and hopefully we can get it in in the 45 minutes. So I guess we're ready to roll this thing. And whenever we're you're ready, ready, we can, ready to go, we'll click it. Yes, please. Click it. And there we go. I think we're all set. If you can see this, we're doing great. All right. Um, I'm just, this is kind of telling you what we're trying to do here. I'm being pretty, trying to be funny with space, the last frontier, but you know, it's that little space, that two inches between the back edge of the track and the wall. How do we deal with this? This is a tough one to deal with because it's so short a space. So we're gonna go over some things that we can do um, to make this space look a little bit more real and hide the back edge of the, uh, of the, of the layout. All right. So one of the easiest ways to improve the look of a whole layout is by adding a backdrop, even if it's just a blue sky. So we're gonna look at this, look at this slide and what I have on the left-hand side is a color swatch that you get from the um, paint company. What I want to do is grab two or three of them, the blues, the ones that you like. And what I want you to do is I want you to take it and put it down on your layout where your lights are and take a picture of it, believe it or not. Take a picture of it and then pick the best blue that you like from the picture and not from the, the little sample that you have. Once you pick that one, then you'll know exactly when you take these pictures that's what the background is gonna look like. And it's gonna look like that for the people too. So when you're there, you wanna get a, a blue that you like, but a blue that's gonna photograph really well. And the next part is painting it. So once you set up your backdrop, you know, your back wall where you've got some kind of hardboard or wall board or something like that. Um, and if you wanna curve your corners, make your corners a little bad, it hides those a little better. It doesn't have to be done, but it works a lot better. You wanna start painting it. And the easiest way to do it is take that blue, that full color blue, and start on the top third of the, of the wall and start painting down. And then in the middle, the middle third, middle, yeah, top third, that's good. Middle, like, let's say half. I'm gonna paint it white, and then I'm gonna start mixing my dark blue into that white, and I'm gonna work to the bottom of the, of the wall into a much, to almost a bright white. So it's gonna go from a very bright white at the bottom, or a light bright white, excuse me, to a very dark blue at the top. And by putting the white paint in the middle, you're gonna mix it together with like a one inch brush, strokes back and forth through a section about three foot wide, work them back and forth and then move over and do it again. If you have a little brush strokes in there, a little things like that, that's not gonna be a problem. The problem is you want it from dark at the top to light at the bottom. And when you do that, you're gonna get the depth of feel that you're looking for. And that's what we're talking on the bottom one that says fading the color. We're gonna go from the dark sky as you look up high to where at the horizon where you get a much lighter sky. And that's gonna give you a bigger depth of field than you think. So let's move on here. Here's what I'm talking about on the screen in the left here. We have a, a, a scenery and from that set of tracks to the back wall is less than two inches. But you see, this would be the wall and it doesn't kind of give you much here because you got, pipes and bricks and cement all in the way. But by just adding a blue sky, you're gonna add a depth of field to this little scene. You got your trees a little transparent, but for now we'll go on to show how we can correct that a little bit more. But now you have a depth of field with just a blue wall adding it and you've added space to that back section. All right, the next one you can add, if you really wanna go crazy, you can go with clouds. Um, and everybody says, oh, I'm not an artist, I can't paint clouds. Well, you know, if you buy a set of these stencils, uh, they come from a company named Loudon Industries out of San Antonio, Texas. The address is right there. 
you can get it next time. They come in two sets of, of cloud stencils. And basically all they are is a uh, cardstock, which the edge is cut up. You can see it here, cut up on the edge. And what you do is by spraying along this edge, you can see how the paint is a little darker. I'm gonna create that same shape that I have on the stencil. So if you look on this little piece we have here, you can see how the clouds are up, up high. And then by turning them over, you can get them down low here the same way. But you want to leave some of this blue showing through in the middle. That gives you the transparency of the clouds. Very simple to do, very easy to do. If you want a little more haze on the edge of the cloud, move that stencil back away from the wall, maybe an inch, an inch, half an inch. Let some of the overspray go through and it makes it a little softer. Again, if you do this and you mess it up and you don't like it, take the roller out, take your blue paint, repaint the wall right ahead and try again. You want to do this probably again about three foot wide at the same time. I'm going to go to the next slide because it tells me a little bit more. If you get a chance to get this, you can look at this on YouTube later on and sit down and read this whole thing. It goes through how to do it um, with, with, with the whole cloud section to, to do it if you want to make it and, and do it. You can really go through this one. But basically what I use is a regular can of flat white spray paint. Um, you can use it on the cloud. Make sure you get a new can. You shake it up good because you don't want blobs and splots is coming out. Um, you can do it with an airbrush too if you really want to do it and get it really nice and fine. But when you spray it, make sure you spray it along the edge of the, of the um, Uh, let me see here. You want to spray in here more than you spray on here. So you're getting the edge here more than you're getting a heavy, heavy, heavy. You can control how much paint you get on the top edge of the cloud. So if you spray more here, let it like overspray here, you get soft looking clouds. And that's basically, um, you can do this pretty quick. Again, if you make a mistake, just paint it over blue and start that section again by turning the, the, the stencil different ways. You can figure out different cloud configurations. If you go to the bottom of clouds, you got to remember as the clouds get farther away from you, all you see is the bottom of the clouds. By turning the stencil over or using the fine stencil, just go across the bottom, spray a little bit of fill-in paint, and as it goes to the horizon, it becomes all white. And so that gives you a little more depth of field. Real simple, not too hard to do. But you can do it. I'm not. Gonna, I don't want to go too fast here. So what you get here now is that same scene with the clouds, and now we're still only that two inches from the track to the back wall. But we've added a lot of depth of field by adding some clouds and basically some blue sky. Uh, nothing. I. This is not artistic. It's just using the stencil and kind of helps you really get it done. You, but you want to see as you look here, this blue part is just not painted. So if you leave this hezzy blue, you get more fluffiness to your clouds. And you can, you can do rows and rows and rows of clouds. Um, people have used some um, gray paint in there to make it a little more storm clouds. You want to go light on that. Very easy. Don't go over it because if you put too much on, it's going to look kind of clunky, as I guess, or, or the cloud will be look too thick. So basically, that's the easiest way to make this thing look bigger is just put a blue sky and some clouds in behind it. And then you get... Uh, the depth that you're looking for in this very short thing. So that picture is better than having that brick wall or that pipe running through it or something like that behind that that wall. So you, you're expanding the look of the layout. The next thing we're going to talk about is if you're going to do maybe an urban scene or you're going to put some ba uh, um, buildings in it. And I use commercial paper backdrops. Um, Walters make instant building. King Mills around if you can find them. They're really great if you can find them. And then plain photos. Uh, there's a company called Railroad Graphics out there. And it uh, sells all kinds of photographs of buildings and things like that. And you can create your own buildings from those. What I do is I've taken these. Um, these are Walter instant photos. And I've taken and I've actually cut them up and added buildings together. By cutting them up and pasting them back together, I can make whatever scene I want. I can make a long scene, I can make a short scene. The real trick to this is always when you buy one of these scenes, one of these uh, instant building scenes or those things, put them on your color copier, make your own copies of it. You can make as many as you want. Um, if you look at this building right here, this building has uh, two other buildings behind it. They're just two of them cut out, stacked behind the, each other. And don't forget, 
I can click on my color copy and click on the mirror image and I can take that building and I can mirror image it and reflect it the other direction or change the perspective of it. And we'll talk about perspective later. Um, the other thing is when you rearrange these things, the two most basic things you have to look for is where are the shadows on the building? See, they're on, if you can see it here, they're over here and over here and over here. Um, so you want the shadows all on the same side because if they're not, it looks kind of funny that the sun's coming from two directions. So make sure those shadows are all going the same direction. The other one is perspective of the building and the perspective happens to be like this building here, how it fades off into the, into the, into the, into the view farther deep. You want to make those perspectives sometimes all on the same side. And we'll talk about that a little bit later too. But this scene right here is just a bunch of pictures that we've glowed together and added. We're going to add that to the back of the scene uh, or in behind bushes or in behind full size uh, buildings. And we're going to get a, a deeper look. Here's what I'm talking about, the shadows in the building. These are some foreground buildings here and these are buildings in the back. See how all the shadows on these buildings are all on the same side? You kind of get the right look. It kind of looks kind of funny when the shadows are not all on the same side. Real simple to do. These are just cut out and glued right to the backdrop. And you get a nice, nice looking city scene with urban high rises in them. And it works really good to make that depth of field really big. Here's a few more, and this is what I talk about. This is a funny looking one because you see this building, the perspective goes in two different, different directions, but this might work here because this could be a street over here and this could be a street over here and you're looking at the end of the building. This one I'll show you a little bit later. This is actually a bump out. This is not pasted against the flat of the building. I'm going to now create a small flat, which is a building flat. When you, when you make copies, of your paper buildings, you must seal the ink on the paper buildings. If you don't seal it, that picture that you see right there where it's got water spots and faded, the ink will run. So you need to get some kind of a clear acrylic seal. I'll show you one at the end of this, this uh, presentation. I'll show you what you can use to seal the ink up so it will not run like this. And that makes it really, um, it, it keeps the color too from fading and things like that. And these, this is just a building that's been cut out with a knife. Um, there's a lot of things you can do. These are my flats, which are one dimensional buildings, which they really are. They can be made from paper. So make copies of them. And these are cut and paste. So basically this building here and this building here are the same pieces. And what I've done is I'm glued them together and I added this shadow you see right here to hide something I didn't want to see. This is another building that's added. But you see here, there's a leg sticking down because the scene of my other buildings comes about this deep and I didn't have to model this down here. I just modeled what you see. Remember, that's a, that's a major rule in, in model railroading is if you can't see it, you don't model it. So don't waste your time. So you can't see the bottom of this, you see it from here up. And the same thing with floor, you know, uh, windows that are, are street level. You don't want a street level win a door or window, you know, halfway up the building. So take a look at what you have for signs. These could be photographs of buildings also. They can be cut out and done the same way. And when I mean cut the cut and paste, put them together, um, then you can make flats that aren't, that have some relief to them. And see what we've done here is we've cut out all these buildings, but I've added, um, I used gator foam and cut it to size and paste it on the front of it. And I put the shadow on this side and then I folded it around this other end that you see here. But now this goes in and out and it gives me a little depth. Even the fence here, I cut the fence out and put it on a block of wood. So it's it's off the front of this building and it just adds a little more depth to the, the back of the building. And we're talking again, this is all done in less than an inch. So you can get a little more depth of feel to this, this plain old piece of paper building. Remember, this is gonna be behind some other front buildings or some other three three dimensional buildings that's gonna add to the scene. This is what I did. You can see some of the buildings are foam core and then some, some plain old um, cut material that I used to hold it together to brace it. And this is a forward building, this is a back building. And just by staggering them in and out, I got a little more depth of field. So I'm using foam core or gator board. Um, it gives you a little more depth. Um, so what I'm talking about, again, I'm actually taking this building here and I cut two of these out because I made copies. 
and then I cut a big section of this out and wrapped it around this corner. So now I've got this same brick face here and this same brick face here. And there's another building here, another one spaced in here. So this is that one you saw where the depth is in and out. It's got what they call negative space and positive space. And that's a very, very um, thing to make a little more, more uh, dimension to it. And then we've got a couple of buildings up in the back just to stick it up over the top. And this is how I've done it. And I'll talk about this perspective later on. Um, we'll, we'll go over that too. Partial buildings. Um, these are buildings that I, this happens to be a building that Northeast Scale Model made and I needed it, but I didn't have room in the track. So I cut it in half, basically. I cut it down and pushed it against the wall. And that gave me um, some backdrop buildings, but they're not a full building. So um, when you do that, make sure you save all those back pieces because those back pieces be, can, can be another building built where the back of this, this particular building now is the front of another building. So save all those pieces, don't throw anything out. Use the back of the buildings. This one down here, if you look at it, is just a steeple of a church. And all it is is basically a cardboard steeple that's set on top of the trees. But because it's set back in the trees, it gives you the idea that there's another building back of the trees and the and the church steeple is just ticking up, sticking out. Again, from the front of this roof to the back of this wall is just about, maybe it's two and a half inches, but it's not very far. But when you get that depth of feel, you're looking like it's even farther. And remember, when you build these things, don't build them full scale, build them a little smaller, and you're gonna get even more depth of field. You're gonna get a, what they call a forced perspective. Your eye sees a building in the front and then a smaller building in the back, it thinks it's farther away. You're fooling the eye again. You can build these um, buildings um, very easily. With a couple plastic windows, some cardboard and bracing, you can make your own buildings. So what you're looking at here is a building right here, and I'll show you the front of it. This is a cardboard frame, a wood frame, and some plastic buildings, windows I had left over, same thing here. Put these two together, and what you end up is that two buildings right there. That two buildings cost me probably 12 bucks to build these things. They're, remember, these are background buildings. They don't have to have as much detail as the stuff that you're gonna have in the front. But when you put these all together, they're gonna add totally to the scene. So very simply made, some leftover parts, some leftover windows. I had a couple of sheets of brick material, but some of these buildings like this, this is not even a brick building. It's just painted red. And I, when I paint my lines, you paint your brush strokes crosswise this way, and it gives you the effect that it's brick. A couple of signs, you know, these are buildings that work really well. So you can get these put into the foreground of the scene. And now you want to be able to hide the edges of the flats because edges are what gives away it uh, the, uh, uh, the, and the bottom of the back uh, backdrop. So what I'll do is this building again is only a building that's only an inch thick. Um, so we put it against the wall and by taking some woodland scenic foliage that I glued directly to the backdrop above the building, it gives me the effect that there's a tree growing behind that building and it looks like I have the whole building. The other one, this is a full of partial tree that's stuck in the corner, which doesn't show me how thick that building is. It, it hides that back edge. Um, so you can do that very easily um, to hide the side of the building. If you have multiple buildings, you can use another building right beside it that comes out a little farther than, that, than the one that's there, and that hides the edge too. There's a lot of things that can hide the edge, a pipe, all kinds of stuff. Then we stuck a paper building way in the back, just stuck right on the back back thing and then you always have this line across the bottom and the easiest way to hide it is a fence or to have the ground go down or the ground go up it's very simple to hide that edge by putting something in front to distract the eye from looking at it um, there are no straight lines in nature um, very few very few straight lines so anything anytime the eye sees a straight line it says oh that's man-made so the fence gives me a straight line but I know that's man-made so I'm not seeing the bottom of the backdrop then almost full size buildings. These are all, these two buildings on the right and the left, uh, this one and this one are leftover pots from the backs of other buildings that I threw together to make this scene. Um, 
a couple of windows. Uh, this one here is um, DPM. I think that's the empty arms. This whole building here is cardboard and it just uh, the windows and some fire escapes. Again, I don't need building. This building is a end of a building. I think it's one of the Walters buildings. Great detail enough for the back. I made up the signs and this to give me the backs of the buildings. Here's that little other building we had stuck right between it. So it's hiding this edge. So the, in this scene, I've taken some buildings and I've made them more dimensional. So now I'm working my way towards the tracks. This one is a corner building. So we might have a little more room in the corner. We may have almost four inches in this corner building. So these buildings can be made from what you have left and what you what you need and what you don't need, you know, in a building when you're using the front. Um, this was just cardboard. We cut the windows out and stuck the windows in from the back side because it would be a masonry building. Then we go to rural stuff, and this sometimes is 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 harder. We're going to do in the distant hills. Um, I'm trying to make hills behind this stuff so I can hide um, the edge again. We're trying to hide the edge. And what I've done here is I've made a profile board. And the profile bird is basically the shape of these mountains. You can see them here. They go up and down. And it happens to be masonite on this particular one. But it could be foam core. It could be gator foam. And what we've done is by changing the coarseness of the ground foam, it's given me more detail here, less detail here, and less detail here. It's a little easy to see in, in, in when you're right up against it. Um, but what it's done is it's taken the detail away from it. So it looks like it's farther and farther away. And I think I have a profile. Yeah, here's the profile board. You can see here that how it's fine over here. It's fine here. It's coarse over here. So these hills, when they get a little farther away, this one looks farther away from, from this one. I've also taken, I'm here in New England. So I've taken, I have rock outcrops all over the place. So I've just painted some of this place gray with a black wash over the top and then put the ground foam around it. And it looks like, you know, rock outcrop, a ledge or something like that. Real simple to do. The other thing is I put a building on my computer and I shrunk it down, put it on a piece of cardboard and stuck it in the back. So now it sticks up through the trees. And I now have one more dimension to the to the depth because I have a building that looks like it's in the distance. And because, again, because it's smaller, it looks like it's farther away. Uh, this is basically what you need for the the um, the, the profile board. Um, Woodland Scenics underground, underbrush, ground foam, light and medium green. Woodland Scenics coarse turf, ground foam, dark, medium green. Woodland Scenics turf, ground foam, and conifer green. White glue. You want to get some Rave or some hairspray, um, unscented. It's a great glue that you can spray over the top of it and it will, will hold it uh, in place. I think I use nothing but white, plain straight white white glue um, to put the foam onto the the uh, backboard. And it's it, you leave it down flat until it dries and you pick it up and fill it in. Put some more in and use the uh, hairspray to fill it in. Yeah, you can see it kind of here because I got a little closer. But where that V is, you can see that, that this stuff is a little less coarse than this stuff and a little less way coarse than this. And it gives it the distance of the hill. Along with the clouds, um, you're creating a distance and texture that makes it looks like it's farther away. Real simple. Again, from here to here is only two inches. We're again right up against the wall. So we're trying to make that. Um, and then once I've got that board and it dries, I'm going to put in my foreground trees. Um, you want to put, as you go back, you can see that these trees are way smaller than these trees. And this tree gives your eye a, a reference. But these trees back here look like they're farther away because they're smaller. This is going to fill in all of this blue when we put that profile board in. So it's really kind of cool because it looks now like, you know, there's a couple of trees sticking there, but that's it, it doesn't give you an idea that it's a full forest in behind those trees. So here you go with the profile board. I got a little rock outcropping here. These are all small trees. They look farther away. 
Here's my mountain sticking up just above it. If I might do this again, I might the mount, might these mountains come up a little bit higher. But here I am with that same scene. We're still that two inches away from the back of the thing. And now I have a full scene that is directly against the backdrop. So my train's running through it and I get a nice little scene. It works out really, really well when I get that um, depth of field that I'm looking for. And that would be if I'm running a country. This could be done also if you did this with a, a mountain scenery with some cliffs and things like that. You can make these back here and then mute, begin to mute these colors. If you have a, uh, if you could do a rock castings, make the rock casting get smaller and smaller as you get towards the back and mute a mute a mute of colors. Uh, so it's a little more uh, fuzzy in the, in the picture. That's what we're looking for, to be almost out of focus. And that's what your eye does. So these trees here set my eye that this is how tall a tree should be. So this one must be farther away. Just then we have fooling the eye. Uh, another way to do this. Um, there's a way to do this for roads disappearing, um, streets going back that you want to do, and that's with mirrors. Um, the best mirrors you can find are what they call front-faced silvered mirrors. They're hard to find, but you can get away with a regular mirror by hiding the edges. Um, the two things you don't want to do is ever place, never place a mirror where you're able to see yourself or other people or full-size non-model railroad objects. In other words, if you have a pipe, when you tip this thing like a sewer pipe coming down and you can see it in the mirror, it's going to look really bad. So you angle your mirror to you get it where you see nothing but what you want the object to see, which is a railroad related. Don't place mirrors where the viewer will be able to see both the moving train and the reflection of the moving train at the same time. It looks very, very funny. And you can do that by angling your mirrors. Um, so I'm gonna show you the next one here. If you look at this building, this is the same one before. If you look here, this back building right here is actually a mirror image of a building that's, as you look down this alley, it makes it look like it's farther back than it really is. And our next slide is gonna show you the back of this building, how we did this. So here's the back of that building. We cut this out and because it's shadowed, it wasn't lit right. So I put some, a string of lights up here so I can give it a, just enough light to make it look like the rest of it. If you're gonna put signs on these buildings, they have to be done in mirror image, so basically written backwards. So when you look in the mirror, they look frontwards. The other thing you see in this thing is there's two trucks here. There's only really one truck because that truck is hiding in the bottom of the mirror. What I didn't go with over is I'll tell you again, the way to hide the mirror on the top is I use this little overpass and you can't see where the top of the mirror is. So as you look down this alleyway, you look at this second street and you can look left and right and you can still, if you look from, from here to here over here, you can see it go down this way. And if you look from here over this way to here, this building goes down this way. So you get some really depth of feel in a very short space. So that's what you do with mirrors. And they can do, a, if you need a road that has to disappear into the woods, you can do that by angling it at the right direction. And we'll talk about that too in just a minute. The nice thing about this trick with the mirrors is that I lit my front building, which is the building. And because I'm lighting my front building, it's lighting that building that's in behind it. And in the reflection, my building is lit. Sorry about the picture, it's a little fuzzy, but I get the idea that that building that's, that's actually a mirror image is now all lit. I put those lights on that building on a rheostat, like a transformer, so I can get exactly the right amount of light that I want to fill in for, the, for that building so it looks like a street behind. So, and the other thing is if you put a car in front of it, the best thing you can do with a car is paint one side one color and the other side another color and put it next to the mirror and it looks like two cars because you're gonna see a red car in the mirror and a black car that's painted facing you. Real simple to do. Now you're gonna, sometimes you're gonna end up with a street that goes directly into the backdrop. Um, you like to make the streets go in at an angle if you can. Um, that way you can have them actually vanish in behind the trees or in behind a building or something like that. But if you run into a point where you want a building that goes straight back into the backdrop, this is a couple of ways you can do it. The first one is called over the hill. 
And basically right here, if you can see this line that goes across here at the top of the road, um, that is actually the back of the building. And these buildings here, our paved buildings, pasted directly on the backdrop. The same thing with this one. The road ends right here, and these buildings are pasted on the backdrop. And I'll show you on the next slide. So what these are is perspective buildings. They have a right perspective and a left perspective. So on this one on the over the hill, all these buildings here are what they call a right perspective. And what we've done is by reducing the size as they go over the hill, it looks like the road turns right and disappears over the hill. And by putting two full-size buildings or relatively full-size building out here in front, it frames that whole picture. If you wanna do a zero, zero uh, vanishing point, all these are right perspective buildings, all these are left perspective buildings, and they all go to this one point right here. It looks like the ride, the road, excuse me, goes right down and disappears. Don't forget, when you're making these um, buildings, you can put them on the copy machine and I can mirror image them so a right building now becomes a left building. So I can add buildings right and left and change them around to left and right. So I can make these vanishing points with this, sometimes the same buildings, but they look completely different. Again, you just cut them to size, paste them in and make sure they drop down in size as you go to the vanishing point. And it works really well when you have a road, a couple of cars that you cut in half, you put right at the base where you're going into the backdrop, which hides the very edge and paint your foreground road the same color as, your, as the background painted road and it disappears right into to the uh, scenery. So here's what happens when you put everything all together. So here we have our blue sky, our, our clouds, Here's our paper buildings right here. All these are directly on the backdrop, okay? Then we have partial buildings that aren't very deep. You can see on this end that it's only less than an inch deep. And then these are a little bit bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So this fills the scene. Then we use the mirror down the alley. This is a corner one and the corner is actually curved. And this gives me everything that I've just done in that scene. Um, and it would put them all together and I've now made this very short distance and I, I think from the tracks to the back on this one is just four inches. So now I've taken this whole corner and I have a big city in this corner and I've only put in one, two, three, four, five, six buildings and the rest is all paper. So I've done a lot of stuff with very inexpensive material and I've got really exactly what I was looking for. And we're talking about the same thing here. When we put them all together, we get the backboard, we get the foreground trees, um, we get the profile board, we get everything in that two inches, and now we have a, a respectable scene that looks like it's pretty deep. This is very easy to do. Um, hopefully it, it, later on, and this will be on something like YouTube if you wanna go back and read the thing about how to do the clouds and getting all that information. I'll give you a little more information at the end too. So we're almost done here. I might be done a little early, so if we have lots of questions, we can go through them. This is a couple of books that I recommend. Uh, the Scenery Tips and Technique from uh, Model Railroad Books is good. How to Build Realistic Railroad by Dave Ferry. That's like uh, the Bible of scenery books. Building City Scenes by John Pike, which is a great one if you're gonna do an inner city building. He has a great ideas and some uh, really uh, good ideas on building a waterfront and heavy, scene, heavy urban scenery. A couple of magazine articles that I found is how to build uh, urban scenes by uh, Earl Smallstraw, a magnificent, uh, great modeler. And then Better back Backdrops, it tells you how to um, build your own stencils with newspaper by tearing them up, really fine. And I've, I've done a couple of them and they come out pretty well. So if you don't wanna buy the stencils, the stencils aren't a lot of money, but you can make your own stencil if you wanna give it a try. So this is about, all I have is there's anybody out there that have any questions, you can probably get them into uh, our guy and we can probably figure it out. Um, I can go back if we need. So I'm sorry? There's three questions so far. All right. We can answer uh, the questions if you like now. Um, I got a couple things I can show. I got a couple new things London I can industry. show them. I'm no sorry. <laughs> new London Industries. Do you know the owner? Right. 
Um, I do not know the owner, but he's still in business. I made sure these guys were all in business that you could get this stuff. So, okay. Someone um, suggested it might be John Delance. It could be. He's he used to live in New England and he moved down there. So, okay. this, how thick is that profile board you had up there? How big is it? How thick? Um, oh, you can use masonite or foam core or gator foam. Go to gator foam comes in eight inch thicknesses. So, if you're going to have to bend it in places like that. Uh, I suggest you use the uh, masonite. It works pretty well. You can get it right around a pretty tight corner. Um, and you, the only other thing I didn't mention that I should mention is when you're putting the um, ground foam on the profile board, you want to make sure that you cover the very top of the board, um, the very top edge very well, and put a bunch of the uh, hairspray on it to keep it in place. Because if not, you'll see that edge. If you look down the alley into that mirror, is there yep. a trick to keep people from seeing themselves? No, nope, because the way that that mirror is angled, you they cannot see themselves in it. If you look Good. at that down the alley, the building to the right of it is the one that's reflecting it. So that angle off is looking at that building and not out the. It's not looking out the um, alleyway, so you cannot see yourself in it. That's a no-no. You cannot see yourself no matter what, how, whatever angle you go at, you can't do it. So when you're putting that mirror in, you want to angle it. So when you look there, you can say, no, I can't see myself, but that, that works right. Then put it right in and glue it up. So what, and actually what that's a plastic glue? mirror. I'm sorry. Well, that sounded horrible. What? What material did you use to paint your background on? The, the blue color. Yeah, what is it painted on? Oh, on my bit, on What's my the material. Uh, um, actually, my layout is um, masonite, which is the same thing I used on this one. It's masonite. What I'm going to suggest is, if you're going to do it on masonite, put the masonite on the walls. You can use masonite. You can use linoleum. You can use plastic. There's all kinds of things. That's a whole nother thing, because if you're going to curve your corners, you want something that's flexible. Don't buy masonite that's what they call tempered. And that means it's waterproof. And especially if you're going to use spackle for your joints. If you use spackle for your joints on masonite that's tempered, because it doesn't take water, they got the holes and the seams are going to pop right out. Let me tell you, I found out the hard way. My whole layout room, I had to go back and do every seam and every screw hole with Bondo that they use to fix your car because every one of them fell out. So you want masonite that is not uh, that will is not waterproof. Is that, so is hold that on, I'm just holding, I was holding the wall on with screws. So basically, what I did is I took the walls of my building, I put fairing strip on it, and then I screwed my um, masonite to those strips, standing off the wall. But I have a dedicated room too. Those same strips could come up from the back of your uh, layout. And you could screw to them too. You wouldn't have to be against the wall. You could be a freestanding um, background. The, um, the reflective material is it in front of the mirror or behind the mirror? All right. The one that I showed you is behind the mirror. But if you can find the reflective mirror in the front, you will not have a front edge of it. Uh, you, you'll you'll see the edge of the mirror. You'll see the edge of the whatever the glass is in the front, and then you'll see the reflection. In a front face mirror, you don't see the edge of the glass because it's reflecting on the front, but they're hard to find. But you can use a regular mirror, believe it or not. You just have to hide the edges a little more. Okay. Um, in, in, in that particular scene, that is actually a plastic mirror that I found and worked pretty well. And I hid the edges with the car. Someone wants you to elaborate a little bit more on the dual painted car in the mirror. I didn't. The problem is, it's a black car. So what I would do is on the one side of the car, I would paint the car red. Let's say I painted red and make it look like a car. And on the side that I see, I would paint it black. So when I look in the mirror, I see a red car that's parked next to a black car. <laughs> that's the way it works. Neatly done. Yep, very easily done. Mirrors are interesting and fun to do. You can do a lot of work with them. Um, John Allen did a ton of work with mirrors. 
Uh, um, so it's kind of cool. You can make ro roads disappear into the scenery very easily, the same way we did it with that alleyway. And it has to do with the angle of the mirror. Again, so, in that in that in that article by Earl Smallshaw, he goes into it well too about how he used it in places where he actually made clouds that came over the edge of the mirror and hid the top of the mirror. So, if you that's another good one if you can find that model railroad, July nineteen eighty nine. Someone wants to know advice for uh, lots of short buildings with limited trees. I'm sorry. Say that again. Uh, if you have lots of short buildings yep. and not a lot of trees, any advice? Um, if you start using some of the paper buildings, and those can be photographs, remember, you can find photographs of buildings that are local as long as they're in the right perspective. You can cut those buildings and put them right against the backdrop and then put these small buildings in front. So what you get is don't make them too taller than the building because remember we want the buildings to drop away so it makes it look good you can then by using build you're going to use buildings paper buildings like trees to hide the back and you can use a few trees in between fences trees anything's like that the other thing you have to be very careful with when you put buildings in front of the scene that you don't end up with a shadow on your backdrop so you're lighting you don't want a shadow that shows the edge of the building so you got to be careful. You got to look at it when you put them in place that they don't throw a, sh a big shadow on the wall. And a couple of trees, you can, all those trees that you saw in those buildings, in those scenes that I did, I made all those trees. They're a bottle brush tree that I make. Very simple to make. I can make them. I made them for our layout in North Conway. I made over 3,000 trees and we made them probably in about two weeks, really quick. Um, and that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother clinic, bottle brush streets, very simple to make. We can do that another time. Now you mentioned you have something else to show us. Yeah, can you get me on the screen? Can you see me? I'm sorry, I don't know if you can see me or not. They can see us. Okay. When you go to, um, when you go to take your buildings and you put them on the printer, you need to seal them. One of the ways, can you see that? That's dull coat. Mm -hmm. You can buy that dull coat. That's a sealer. Um, the only problem is this is like $6.95 a can. If you go to your big box stores, you can find this stuff. It's called acrylic sealer. It's a matte finish. It's probably about $3 cheaper than that little can of, of uh, dull coat. It doesn't, it also dull coat's not very good for you to breathe. This is a little bit better. You can find this in big cans and art stores box, big box stores, Walmart type things like that all over the country. So if you can find this stuff, it works great for a lot of things. If you wanna seal up chalks or pastels, you can use this stuff. It works really good and it's not, it doesn't stink, boy. That dull coat is the worst stuff. So that's one of the other things I'm looking for. Um, uh, if you can see me, um, let me see if I can do this. I'm gonna turn the, computer here and you tell me if you because i can't see it i'm going to show you that urban scene and i've got trains in it can you see it yet it's moving in i'm sorry it, yes can you see lower. the scene a little bit yep. lower there you go there you go there's a scene with a couple trains in it um this is a i build these these scenes so i can practice my techniques um I built a swamp and things like that just so I know how to do that stuff. I'm probably jiggling it all over the place. So, nope. and then on this side, all right, how about that? Can you see that other scene now? Yes. All right, that's the other scene. So they're not that big, but they take up quite a spit, bit of uh, space on your layout. These are a little bit different because um, these are my travel stuff. So these all travel with me when I do my um, clinics so people can see them firsthand. Actually, some of those buildings I can pass around and people can look at them. So when I do my clinics, it's mostly hands-on. I'm a very hands-on guy. Everybody has to look and touch and feel and all that stuff. So, <laughs> yeah. So I guess, I guess I, that's the way I, I, I'm sorry. 
I'm I'm pretty sure most modelers are pretty much hands on. Oh yeah, they want to see it. They want to feel the texture of it. You know, and it's amazing um, how much they'll get out of it more by looking at the piece than yeah. than just uh, having somebody show you a picture of it on a on a screen. So. Well, I wonder where the cameraman is. <laughs> what to switch us off? This, yeah, you have a question for the audience that they can answer in the chat. Um, do I have a question? Yeah, a question that uh, yeah. everybody, all hundred and forty-five of them, can answer. Um. Yeah, I, I got a question. Maybe I can figure this out. Maybe they can answer me a question. How many of those people out there are? model layout people and how many out there are diorama builders it's a we question i always that. wonder about and i can deal with both of those if i know about what's going on um and the other thing the other question is how many people out there enter the contests the structure context um everybody worries about oh he's gonna wreck my building. he's gonna he's gonna pick me apart i'll tell you something if you get good people that are doing the the uh, judging they're going to tell you exactly what you need to fix your stuff to make it better and some more techniques um so i would not be afraid to go into a uh, um a contest just to show your stuff off it's good to you know you feel proud about it no one is going to pick you apart and call you a jerk and this is not good enough they're going to tell you this is what we like this is what we don't like this is what you can fix and make better so don't be afraid of the contest so I started in contests. I went for the contest for a long time. I've scored some good points in national. I've done in regional and and even in in club stuff. So that's kind of how I started out. I didn't have room, so that's what I started doing. So we have ten layouts and no dioramas. Okay, good. That's even better. I always ask that at my um, my clinics, just so I know what's what's going going down. So One I do. I have a lot of fun because I get to do um, all the the work for Bar Mills. When they have a building we want to do, I get to do the to make up what I want to to look like and do like this and get a start with an idea, and then from there we all pick it apart. So it's kind of the fun part, the imagining part um, that everybody here that I bet everybody likes to do. That's an awesome That's hobby. Awesome. It's a great. Uh, it's one of those hobbies that has so many things you have to learn to do. I mean, right. you've got electronics, you've got carpentry, you've got scenery, you've got rolling stock, you've got just the history of railroad that you all have to have some kind of knowledge about. Yeah. So I think it rounds you out really well. Well, Jack, thank you for a brilliant clinic. I'm definitely going to watch it again. Um, if anybody's looking for this clinic or they're looking for a CD, um if they want to email me i can send them a pdf of the clinic it's um j c s j at roadrunner.com if they send me an email asking for it i'll zip one right out to them it's a 23 page thing on this it goes a little more into more detail but it's a good thing to have and Jack is a man of his word. He already sent it to me. Yeah, that's no problem. It's easy to do when I can just send it on, on email. Well, if that's what we need to do, that's cool. I'm all set. Thank you, Jack. Thank you guys for watching.